have you here. How have you been? <laughs> well, I believe the first thing I believe is that we are not our circumstances. We are great human beings capable of love and compassion and uh, our circumstances be damned. And we to that pretty... order, it's, fi it's five o'clock, so I have a beer with me. <laughs> you know, I read that you are a connoisseur of fine wines. Is that yes, correct? Yes, I am. And that's because okay. there isn't a bottle of wine in this house right now. <laughs> well, here's my question for you is when I go to the supermarket now to get wine, what am I supposed to go look for? The most expensive bottle is $12.99. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, quite seriously, um, I would look at the New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs. New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. It's, um, and the nice thing about it is New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is a style of, of white wine that has a wonderful kind of grapefruit type of taste, a little bit of a touch of a grapefruit to it, uh, and a wonderfully dry wine. And um, it, it seems to be so popular right now, and, and rightfully so, because you can spend $80 for a bottle of it, and you can spend $4 for a bottle of it. And you know what? They both taste the same. Uh, it's really? uh, that's right. That's what I say. New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs, I think, are the easy, easy. Uh, that's the go-to wine right now. That's an easy drinkable wine every night. So that's good. And like not only not only every night, but all night, just all. Night. <laughs> just <laughs> so it's five o'clock somewhere. So that's a good. Exactly. One. So what have you been doing with this little mini vacation downtime that you have? Well, it's kind of an, it, you know, it's an enforced vacation, which is uh, different than a chosen vacation. And and the longer it goes on, it's like uh, you start to say, OK, I'm finished. But it's a little bit like, you know, having a bowl full of icing that you've been covering the cake with. And at one point you go through and you go, OK, I've had enough icing. I've had enough icing now. Can I? Uh, and it's a little bit like that. But, you know, it, it's um, these are the circumstances that we have. And we have to make the best of them. So I've been trying to make them as creative as possible. Um, and I, you know, take things like this and I say, how do I come out the winner on this? And so I, I kind of uh, challenged myself to do some things that I wouldn't ordinarily do or find the time to do. Uh, I'm reading a great deal. I'm reading the biography of John Adams right now by uh, David McCulloch, um, which is one of the most fascinating things to read. And oddly enough, to read in this kind of odd time that we're all in, because um, the biography really is about that period of 1776 when we were birthing this nation. And if you remember, you wouldn't remember, but why should you? No, uh, I should ask my mom, though. She was there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, the fact that but when we were birthing this nation, it was against all odds. We had a ragtag militia uh, army uh, of 9,000 people led by George Washington, who couldn't even locate all of his, uh, his uh, soldiers. Um, against an army of, uh, of, of a hundred thousand British and 400 frigate ships that were waiting in New York Harbor. You know, it, it's against all odds things, this country was formed. And it is so interesting to read that book at this time and to get the actual emotionalism of, of the characters saying, you know, we don't know if we're going to be alive tomorrow because um, we're not sure that, uh, you know, that they're not going to uh, have a swing in from the end of a, a rope at the, uh, on a tree. And uh, it, it, at the same time that we're going through this tumultuous time uh, in our nation's history, uh, it's interesting to read that book as well. And I find them, I find it um, a, a wonderful, wonderfully interesting parallel. I'll tell you, um, speaking of books, when I was looking up, I mean, to be honest and to be fair, when I first met you, I was doing a Comic-Con with Mickey Dolenz and Barry Williams. And I had told my husband, I said, you're not going to believe who's going to be at this Comic-Con. And I told him it was you. He's been a fan of yours forever. Oh. And I was like, oh, I'll get you his autograph. And then I wound up having a conversation with you. And I called home and I was like, this guy's awesome. Forget about Seinfeld. He's fascinating. But I started right. looking at some information. I had no idea that you were um, a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, yes, I, I, I have written three books, uh, two adult books uh, and one children's book. Uh, I have another children's book that I would like to write. Um, the first children's book called The Perfect Dog, believe it or not, is now a, um, is now a musical that is a theatrical musical that's done all over the world. 
Uh, it became so it, grew, it it morphed from uh, just a simple idea to a book to, to to now a musical. So it's been fun to watch the evolution of that happen. But I've written two other books. I, you know, I just do things because I whatever my imagination tells me to do is what I do. And when my imagination told me to write a book, I wrote a book. And uh, one book wow. began another book, and another book began another book. And uh, I still have more in me. Well, now what came first, your interest in dogs or the pet show? Um, well, I've always had, you know, I mean, I, I, I've always been around dogs my entire life. I had uh, my earliest memories of being four, year old, four years old uh, was uh, always around my dachshund, Taffy, my little uh, dark uh, brown-haired uh, dachshund, and uh, I, I've always had a dog. And, and, and I wrote in one of my books, I'm a better man with a dog in my lap. I, I just believe that dogs uh, round out the, the edges in our lives. And, uh, and, and we need that more than ever right now. In fact, I get so many letters from people who uh, talk about the fact that their dog is really saving them through this entire uh, uh, lockdown period because, uh, the, you know, the dogs don't realize what time is. They know now and they know never. So they're, as long as you're with them, they're, it's now. And if you happen to walk out the door, it's never, you're never coming back. So it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderfully, they have wonderfully redemptive personalities in that they allow us to be anybody we want and they still love us. I have to say, I do think my dog is wondering why I haven't left the house in six weeks. I do get that. She stares at me with that, that face that's like, don't you guys have something to do? I need some alone. Yeah, yeah this is not, yeah, I know. Oh, there, listen, listen, our dogs love lockdown right now. That should be great. We're, we're <laughs> home all day long. They couldn't be happier. We go for, we go for uh, about two to 300 walks a day. Uh, it's a little, <laughs> no, they love it. Now you, the, the big show that you do, you actually host it. It's near where I live in Oaks, PA. The, the, uh, that's the National Dog Show presented by Purina there on Thanksgiving Day. Yeah, that's one of two that we do now uh, on NBC. It's become the mothership for all dog shows. Um, they, uh, they also have now uh, success begetting success. Um, we have the Beverly Hills Dog Show, which we um, aired a version of uh, just this past weekend. Uh, yeah, we watched it. Mm -hmm. it, was supposed I, I, to be, it was supposed to be the 2020 dog show, but unfortunately we shot that, but we can't air it yet. I did like the promos with the dog and the, and the tux and the boxer shorts and the, um, and the sandals. That was yeah, it that is. Well, it's, Beverly Hills. The Beverly Hills dog show, it's a dog show done differently, but it's a fun, <laughs> it's a fun version. But we have, um, we'll be doing the 2020 show. We still have some post-production to do on it. So uh, we'll be doing that, probably airing it later on in, um, in uh, the spring here. So oh, that's, good. Still, well, that's the 2020 still to come. Well, that's always a good thing. At least we have something to look forward to. Now, mm -hmm. question for you. I have to ask you about, you know, obviously... Seinfeld is where so many people know you, but in my house, you're pretty big because of King Neptune from SpongeBob. Mm -hmm. What? Well, <laughs> well, you know, I have a lot of uh, a lot of cartoons that I do, and I enjoy doing them. You know, I and I, I, I really focused on that arena for a long time because having a 13 year old son who was uh, uh, growing up, I wanted to have him. I wanted to have a body of work that I could give to him that he could enjoy. Uh, and it was a lot of fun to watch him, uh, watch the shows that, that I was doing. And, uh, and I remember, I remember taking him to school one day, uh, about, you know, seven 30 in the morning on an on drop on normal morning drop off. He goes, daddy, why is it that everybody wants to know you? <laughs> And I think he was probably six, maybe at the time or something like that. And I said, well, well, not everybody. Trust me, nobody wants. I said, you know, people, uh, uh, people watch what I do for a living. And so I had to, you know, kind of explain to him what I did. Um, and it's interesting to have to explain to your child that you have a body of work that a lot of people have an opportunity to see. And so therefore you have this kind of celebrated uh, personality, if you will. And, um, and it's an interesting thing for him to understand. Um, 
what's wonderful about it is it doesn't really mean much to him anymore. It's like, okay, big deal. And there's you know, my which dad. Is, which is, well, it's uh, like, yeah, okay, done that. That's, you know, it's, but it's fun to have that body of work, especially, you know, King Neptune on SpongeBob and Phineas and Ferb on Disney and a, 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 about 15 other cartoons that I do and I enjoy so much. But, um, you know, it's fun to have a body of work that he could watch. And that, that meant, that meant the world to me just to be able to have something that he and his friends could, you know, put their arms around and, and I could be part of. It's got to be funny, though, because you've got in that age demographic, because our kids are the same age, you've got the parents who obviously know you from Seinfeld and you've got the women who remember you from the soap operas, mm -hmm. you dancing with the stars. So you've got the parents that want to know you, but then the children that want to know you at this. It's just it's a unique situation, I would imagine. All the moms want to know who you are. It <laughs> really is. It's my evil plan. It's my evil plan to own every single demographic. It's it's, it's just it's working. Bought out totally. Trust me. <laughs> every it's, time it's, I it's, and it's all evil. <laughs> I know you have that laugh. That mm -hmm. you know. Oh. It's, it's... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I I will own you all. Now, when you did the SpongeBob movie, you were in that first movie, right? I was not actually in a movie. That was uh, Jeffrey Tambor that did the movie. Uh, oh, he did the movie? Happened. I think there was something where I couldn't do it. I don't know what happened, but I wasn't able to do it. Uh, but he was. He did. He ended up doing the movie. I've done the all the TV series. So. Oh, the TV series. What of all the things that you've done? Because, I mean, I, I, I wasn't, I don't think when Seinfeld came out, I was still in high school and I didn't kind of get that humor at the time. I think uh -huh. I'd uh -huh. be a little bit older for that. Sure. The reruns I understood, but I did understand the controversy with Dancing with the Stars. I don't even know why I was watching that show. I don't think I've watched it since then. But was that real controversy? Like, was that a thing? Oh, it was. You know, it was, it was real controversy because... Um, it, they hadn't, ABC had not figured out the, the voting mechanism. And, and remember, this show, that first year, was really just a, um, a summer series replacement, as all it was, uh, just to try out a show in the middle of the summer, see if it had some legs. And sure enough, it did, and it became one of the biggest hits they've had, you know, for uh, imaginable for the network. Uh, and rightfully so, I would say. I think it's one of the great series uh, that uh, has ever been created because it celebrates talent and it celebrates something as elegant as ballroom dancing, which had totally disappeared from our culture. But uh, that, that the first season was, you know, kind of a, you know, we were trying just not to fall down on our faces there. It was, we didn't realize really it was a competition as much as we were just trying to stay alive. And... Um, and lo and behold, the, the, you know, the voting system, you know, was a little askewed and they realized that they were going to have a train wreck, uh, but they couldn't stop it. And um, lo and behold, at the end of the, the series where, um, you know, we had we had some issues in the in the in the voting and the performances and what have you. And forty three thousand people have shut down the, the Internet on the, over at ABC and uh, they had to try to figure something else out. And they did. And they did very well. And they were able to, uh, you know, my hat's off to them that they were able to then they had a, a dance off that we called and they uh, they put together the live voting system, which is what they use now for, which is great. Uh, it gave them an opportunity to test it out early. So, you know, no harm, no foul. It all worked out great. And uh, um, I read I read, though, that you you were especially good to your partner financially because <laughs> they didn't have in place, I guess, the way to reward the partners. Yeah, you, you, I don't, you've read something that I probably didn't read, but I made sure that uh, that Charlotta, who was my partner, was very well taken care of. Um, I was very I, impressed I, with I was, that. <laughs> it was, I at least, had, I, you know, we were in a, in a position to be in the driver's seat uh, on that, and I made sure that she was uh, well taken care of. But more, more importantly, um, when we did the dance-off there, that uh, the first season, um, we put $150,000 for each of us up for charity, which was an enormous amount of money. And um, I ended up starting... Um, 10 cancer projects um, 
through a, a, a fund called Golfers Against Cancer, but we started the research and development for 10 cancer projects with uh, the money that was uh, raised during that period of time. Four of them are still accepted cancer regimens. So when I look back at all of that chaos during that first you know, season of Dancing with the Stars, I think of the success of the people that are alive today because we were able to, to, to funnel that money into something so important and meaningful. Um, and, you know, there are people walking around on, on the face of this earth right now because of Dancing with the Stars and, and who'd have thought. You know, um, a lot of times I have the opportunity to meet celebrities like yourself and from being on the opposite side of the table and I get to really observe you guys, I wonder sometimes if if celebrities do realize the impact that they do make on a person's day. And I've had the opportunity to hear stories, but what about you? I mean, obviously you were able to help people with the charity, but you've probably been able to help people through some tough times just by them gravitating towards something that you do. Do you feel ever like that's a responsibility in being a celebrity that you come into somebody's home and we feel like we know you? Yeah, it is. But, you know, it's interesting that this time, um, you know, this period of social lockdown, and I mean that cultural lockdown as well, um, it, it really calls to mind who the true heroes are in our lives is that because we live in such a cushioned environment, um, we look to our, inter our entertainers as our heroes because we don't need to think about our survival. But in this period right now that we're going through with the results of this, this awful virus that's infiltrating its way through our, our, um, our world, um, we tend to have to look to our survival as the thing that is fundamentally important. And so we look to our military that is, is, has stepped up in such an incredible way. We look to our health professionals that have stepped up in such a in, in profound way. Our political leaders that have got to all of a sudden put a different hat on, stop being politicians and start being uh, administrators of a global epidemic. And we start to think how little we effect we have as entertainers uh, in terms of... Um, what we do for people. It's, I would like to see those people rewarded now because um, they, they, they do fundamental things and yet they know not what they do every time they do them, but they are doing fundamentally important things. And, you know, as entertainers, it's, it's better for us to take a step back right now and realize that, yeah, we have an influence on people's lives, but these are the people that are really doing it. It's not it ain't, this is not a time where it should be about us. Um, you let the real, the real heroes step are in. Out, yeah, are out, there in the, are out there in the trenches right now. And, and they really are. I mean, you think about somebody that's walking into a hospital right now uh, for his 12-hour uh, shift. Um, and I just wrote something to um, an ER nurse the other night that uh, got, went viral on the Internet. But I, but I said that, you know, it's, it's you know, sometimes we, we dress our, our, our heroes in, in battle metal and sometimes we do it in cotton, in uh, cotton masks. And yet they do the same things. Um, and, and that's, you know, I, I, I think hats off to those people right now. And we need to, I think the entertainers need to uh, back off a little. We look at you for a, a smile, but I, I have to say what was really unique was going into a place like Walmart, and you know that these workers are not making anything to write home about financially, and yet they're going to work every day. And I found myself wanting to say, thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. We've always said to military people, but realistically, if it wasn't for them who are making just above minimum wage, where would we all be? You know, they're the essential people right now, and we're all sitting at home needing them. It's a real eye-opener, no, I guess. A, it's, a, it's a very good point, is that we exist on this earth because there's an extraordinary supply chain. There are farmers that are still working the fields every day. Uh, there are truckers that are carrying everything across the country. There are pilots that are flying planes, some of them uh, fairly empty. Um, 
but are still getting them done. Um, you know, it's, it's, there are people that are still enormously in touch with the human condition every day and the human experience right now that, you're right. We do take for granted. I, you know, I got something delivered by a, a FedEx woman today. Um, God bless her. She came to the, she goes, I'm not allowed to touch you. I'm not allowed. So she was handing this thing to me and dropped it there. And I had to pick it up and, and, uh, and, and bring it back into the house. But it's like, you, you realize that this person has got to live with the threat of, you, you don't know if she could, you know, catch the virus as, as well, but in the normal, in a normal operation of her day and God bless her for doing it. Yeah, we're, we're actually pretty lucky for everybody. The people that you least think that you need to appreciate are the ones who are on the top of the food chain right now that we need to appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad that I'm not the only one that feels that way. Um, question for you. Now, I know we're going to get back to normal. Everything's going to eventually get back to the way that it should be. And you have some really cool projects coming up that I would, I would love you to tell people about because it's the first I've heard about them today. Um, I have a couple of things. Yeah, some fun stuff. Uh, I continue with my one man show around the country and it's called A Man With Standards. And it's uh, um, uh, I take the standards, the songs of the 50s and the 60s, which was that period of time that I grew up in as a youngster. Um, and I take the old Sinatra tunes and uh, Mancini, Moon River, all of those wonderful songs. But I use those to underscore the stories of my life, you know, kind of the strange little quirky little things that I have. And I, and I, uh, and I am at my heart a storyteller. And uh, so I like to, uh, so I use the music to do that. And uh, it's, 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 as I describe it, it's great music, it's great fun, and it has, has only one tier. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. It's done very well all across the country when I tour. I have that continuing. I have uh, um, a, an interesting show on uh, Home and Garden TV that's coming up. I have a pilot we're shooting for it, and I think it'll do quite well. Uh, but it's called Buy Like a Billionaire, and it takes basically a, uh, a couple of, of average means. Um, and they get to show them uh, three different multimillionaire properties. Uh, and... A multimillionaire has bought one of these properties. They have to figure out, after touring all three properties, which one they purchased based on what they kind of glean from what the house has and what the person has uh, their needs. And so uh, it's kind of a fun, it's, you know, it's kind of that old uh, idea of, uh, uh, of uh, God bless him, Robin Leach, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And uh, so it has a little bit of that combined with a lot of fun uh, that's very interactive. Um, and if they catch, if they guess the right property that was purchased, uh, they show pays them, uh, pays their uh, mortgage off for a year. So it's a nice little prize. Uh, and then I have that and I have uh, my show on Shop HQ, the shopping channel, uh, because of my uh, love and affiliation with the world of dogs. I try to bring the best dog products that I have gleaned from around the world to, uh, to people to make them accessible and to make them affordable. Um, so Shop HQ is a great home for me and I love it. They've been absolutely wonderful and uh, it's a fun show. And what makes it even more fun is that uh, every show I have shelter puppies with me. So the whole show, every time you see it, every hour, I do six hours on uh, a, a day when I'm there once a month and uh, I've got shelter puppies with me and they are just, and, and I'll tell you, the, everybody, the entire, uh, the entire administration over there at the network all stop just to come down to watch the show because they, it, it, the morale just uh, leaps through the, uh, the ceiling uh, when the puppies are there. So it's, it's a amazing what a puppy can do. It makes, no, you, it isn't makes it everyone amazing. smile. It's amazing, it's amazing what they do for us. Dogs round out the edges in our lives. That's what they do. I just got my first my first puppy about four years ago, and I bought it for my son. And nobody can touch the dog. I mean, it's mine. It's I, I this I just it's the best thing that I've ever come up and, with. Yeah, and you know the nice thing too is that most dogs are they kind of single onto one person. Uh, you probably are the, um, the um, you are probably mother feeder 
So therefore, because you feed Can you the tell, dog, I yeah. give the dog whatever it wants. There you go. Mine well, is chocolate, you go. of course. There you go. If, if food comes from mommy, then that's, that's who we <laughs> lean to. But, it's, uh, but how great. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you celebrate that. It's, it's, uh, and I know it's added a lot to your life. So let me ask you something. When you were on The Family Feud, you hosted that. We, we watch that show here. Steve Harvey has it now. And I just think it's the dumbest show I've ever seen in my life. But when you, <laughs> what, is it supposed to be like people can't possibly say such outrageous well, things, can they? It, you know, it did. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. I, I left it because it was, you know, getting a little too, you know, it was becoming a, what do I say, a penis joke? You know, and, and that it, was, it's everything. That's that, exactly it, where I was going with it. Yeah, it, just, it just, you know, it was no, I, I've done other shows for that, uh, th those producers. Uh, I did, um, 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 what am I thinking? You've got a secret. I've, I've got a secret. I've, I've got, I've got a secret. Um, and, um, oh, I'm sorry. No, not, I, I, to tell the truth. That was what it was. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, to tell the truth. Uh, and that was my favorite job in my life. Why? Uh, what made that I, favorite? Even, even, even if you asked me if Seinfeld was the best job I ever, I would say no. To tell the truth, it was the best job I ever had. Well, I read uh, today that you didn't even originally want to take the role for Seinfeld. Well, Seinfeld was, you know, I mean, I had, what happened, I mean, let me tell you the backstory on that. Um, <clears throat> my show on ABC had been canceled the day before. And so... <clears throat> I was out. Which dinner. show was that? Uh, it was called uh, A Whole New Ball Game with a very celebrated cast. Very, I mean, uh, you'd, you'd recognize everybody in the show. It's a great series, very funny. But they were moving, yeah, ABC was moving it back and forth and all around, and nobody, uh, you know, so it could never really develop an audience because you couldn't find it. And um, yeah. ended up canceling it. Um, but they canceled it on a, a, a Tuesday or a, a Tuesday. And um, I went out to dinner that night with my manager. Uh, crying in my beer, trying to take the cancellations personally as I possibly could. And um, Larry David's office had called his casting people and said, we have this uh, role on Seinfeld tomorrow. Would you come in for it? Um, and, um, and I said, no, nah. I said, I'm not. tell him I'm not interested. That's, you know, yeah. still licking my wounds. Um, so he never called. And the next morning he says, get up, go over there blow it out of your system and go have some fun. So that was the table read through that day. And so I went there and I was looking through this. And they said, here's the catalog. We just wanted to sound the way the catalog is written. Um, and I read this catalog, the Jay Peterman catalog, which I'd never seen before. And, uh, and it sounded a little bit like a, you know, a forties radio drama combined with a little bit of a bad Charles Kuralt because it sounded like a, an old Hemingway novel that you were catching kind of mid paragraph. And, uh, so I thought it, uh, yeah, so I gave it kind of a funny, you know, t uh, lilt to it. It was kind of this heroic, uh, uh, poet on the cliff, you know, and, um, sure enough, they, they thought it was, they loved it. And that, and, and by the end of the episode, I was working there at uh, on the show and um, was there for five seasons and uh, it was uh, just a fantastic time. It was uh, it was like going to uh, it was like uh, always knowing that every week you could go to the uh, the cathedral there and uh, and the pope was going to be there. It was. Just what do you, would you ever reprise that role? I mean, it seems like something they should have done a I guess a, a, a spinoff. Well. You, know, you have to be careful with characters because characters are, again, I'll go back to the idea of icing on the cake. It's not the cake. The cake is what you're there to buy. It's the In doses. And, you know, the icing, and I'm, you know, icing is, you don't want to watch too much icing. Um, <laughs> and I think characters like that get a little too, you know, uh, uh, so far they depart from reality so much that there really isn't a center keel. And every time they do something with a character like that, it, more than not, it doesn't work. Um, you need some sense of normalcy and have all the lunacy happen around it. That's why, success, that's why uh, Seinfeld was a success. Jerry, you say, well, Jerry was boring. Well, yes, but you needed some sense of what was normal in that world 
so that all the chaos could work around it. And that's why that, that series was so successful, is that he was always forgiving of the lunacy that went on around him. And you, are- you, can, say, you can say it was a show about nothing, but it was a show about redemption, because no matter what happened, these people would sell each other out in a second. <laughs> Um, but it was always, uh, everything was always ultimately redeemable. And that's, I think, what, you know, what, I think that was the success of the show. Well, I think one of my favorite moments in my life dealing in this goofy business that you guys were in was we were sitting at a bar in Massachusetts and it was you, it was Mickey and a couple other people. And we were drinking and all of a sudden you went into <laughs> the Mr. Peterman character doing the whole um, with the cake <laughs> with the lean <laughs> with the cake. Oh, yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was probably the funniest thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> oh, yes. Elaine, do you have any idea what happens to a butter-based frosting after six decades in a poorly ventilated British basement? I have a feeling what you're about to go through will be punishment enough. Good day. <laughs> oh my God. So I got to ask you, most of the people that follow me are into music. What do you have a favorite um, record, a favorite band? I know that you used to be in a band a, a oh. long well, time the worst, ago. The worst rock and roll band ever assembled. Hmm. Oh, Nickelback? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, we were the the Whiskey Rebellion. We booked one job. It was my brother's graduation dance from seventh grade in in high school. We got 50 bucks for it. And uh, we didn't deserve much more for it, let me tell you. Uh, We didn't play any of the Monkees tunes, unfortunately. We weren't that good. Uh, I did, you know, I did attempt Jimi Hendrix, uh, Purple Haze, and that was... uh, the guitar, the guitar solo was something I wish someone had recorded because you would have died. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, and we got fifty bucks for it. It was, uh, it was, uh, but we were the risky rebellion, you know. We bought, <laughs> Listen, we you have a good name. That's all you need. That you need a good name because it, it kind of belied the whole prepubescent acne that we had all over our face and the fact that we weren't going to be seeing much whiskey, but. Um, the uh, and and the funny side note to that was we were so bad that we only had small amplifiers and we had so we had to run around to all of our friends who were actually had working bands and we had to borrow <laughs> all of their equipment and and for the night just to have to look like we were a working band you know the large Marshall amps and the things that uh, the Vox and and uh, Fender and all the other you know the great names so we had them all up there on stage. But uh, what Bozo forgot to do is to bring all the connecting cables. So we looked, <laughs> we looked, we looked like a band, but we sounded like that little 40 watt amp that we had in the corner, which was all we could plug in. Oh, oh gosh, my gosh, that was awesome. Like, so and, what, and, and, what, do you, does, what does the most fascinating man in the world, because I know that you're, you don't say you are the most fascinating, but I think you are. No, I'm, I'm the seventh most interesting well, man in the world. I, I, you might be the sixth most fascinating man to me, but yeah, seventh is okay. I can't move. I can't move. You can't move. When, when, <laughs> when Bruce Jenner became Caitlyn Jenner, I didn't move up. <laughs> I'm, I'm there. I'm there at number seven. I'm, I'm there at number seven. <laughs> Not Stuck even. in the middle. <laughs> so what do you listen to? What kind of music do you listen to? You know, I listen, I have such an eclectic um, taste. I, you know, I, I, I studied opera, so I love opera. Um, but and you're I, a pianist I, I, also, right? Pardon me? You're a pianist. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, I've composed, I have three albums out. Yeah. Um, the, um, but I, um, what do I love? Hmm. I don't know. In, in, you know, because we're talking about the pop music world. I won't go off into the esoteric stuff that I like, but um, I love my music. Um, and I compose in my style, and I enjoy that t- immensely. And I listen to my music all the time. But um, I like, you know, I love, um, like, Don McLean's American Pie. I never get tired of listening to American Pie. I never get tired of listening to um, Money for Nothing, uh, Dire Straits. I love that. Wow. I just love that. 
Yeah, I just love what they did. Um, I love the early Beatles. I just think they're, those harmonies and those songs were so innocent and to the point where I can't even listen to the lyrics because the, the lyrics meant nothing but the music and the melodies and, and those tight harmonies at the time were so innovative. Um, and those were Did great. you ever get to see the Beatles in concert? Back, pardon me? Did you ever get to see the Beatles in concert? No, I never did. And, and I had one moment in time I always said to myself, and this is a true story, I said, someday my life will be complete if I meet one of the Beatles. And I'm over in, I'm in Las Vegas and I'm sitting and, and it was right after Seinfeld was, you know, going through its huge swing there. And I'm, I'm there at the Hard Rock Hotel and this British guy brushes me up against the, lawn he goes or, or against my arm and and says big fan and i said well thank you very much and he turned around and i didn't even turn to look at him and i went back to my conversation which apparently i was impassionately involved in and the person i'm talking to stops he goes you don't know who that was and i said who's that he goes who's george harrison and i went oh my god and i look around and this cluster of people is now moving past that you know, taking him wherever he was going in and out of or watching. I don't even know why he was there. Uh, but, and I thought to myself, you had the moment and you missed the meaning. But you have a story that's one crazy story. I, I, and I just, so I still have not, um, I, I've seen Ringo on many occasions. I still have not, we still, I mean, we've been over at uh, like uh, Sirius XFM or Sirius XM and those at the same time and, you know, kind of going in and out of studios, but we've never talked, but I, but I'm, you know, someday I'll, but you know what? I met Mickey Dolenz and that's enough for me because he was part of the American Beatles. He was part of the monkeys. And I'll tell you, you know what? That was such a significant time in my life. The monkeys were pretty profound back in the sixties. They, they ruled, they were our, home version of the Beatles. I just, I, you, your points just went way up with everybody. Yeah. So, all right. I have a question real quick because I don't want to keep you much longer. I'm sure I have to go back to staring at my ceiling for a much longer time than I did this morning. Mm -hmm. you, when you, uh, you do comic cons and you, you have all these projects, if people want to follow where you're going to be, is the best place to follow you on Twitter at I am John O'Hurley? Uh, I guess so. Yes, that was usually. Yeah, I, pre I pretty much keep everybody abreast of where I'm going to. Although I don't know where I'm going to right now. <laughs> I'm going to have to knock on your door and say, can I please fix your website so that yeah. everybody can meet you? Because I got to tell you, you are just. I mean, just so wonderful. I, I got to see you in Chicago on Broadway. And that was, I had no clue that you sung that way. I just, I, I had no idea. I mean, I was used to you on television to see you perform in front of an audience and hear the people in the background, knowing that I was going to be meeting you after to talk to you. I was, thought I was like the most important person in the room. You were just oh. incredible in that role. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, you know, at Chicago is, I, I kind of think of Chicago and the role of Billy Flynn as kind of my role. It was kind of, um, it's one of those things that I guess <clears throat> nobody should be born to play it, but I guess I was. He's, he's, um, uh, he's, he's a touch of a sleaze, but uh, oh, well, elegantly, uh, elegantly gowned and, uh, uh, and well spoken. Sleaze and a tux. Yeah, yep, yeah, that's exactly right. And I still look like one of the uh, the, the uh, um, general manager at uh, Frisco Steakhouse. But that's uh... <laughs> so. If you if you had your one dream show to do, what would that be? You know, that's interesting. Um, I used to love the idea of doing a talk show um, because I love you know trying to make people look good you know, bring them out. And, you know, we've lost that with Johnny Car. You know, Johnny Carson's passing was the idea, the notion of that everybody came onto your stage and you left everybody um, with a little bit of a laugh late at night, but just before they're going to bed, we've lost that. 
and and it, it, they become political arenas and very sardonic humor. Um, and, and I miss I, I miss the idea of just having a you know kind of a gentle laugh before you you went to bed. And I and uh, I, I so I I think I'd love to do a, a late night talk show. Well, it looks like I've got some extra time on my hands that I can start trying to make that campaign happen. <laughs> <laughs> I. I was the genius that started the John O'Hurley should do um, should host for Alex Trebek once he retires. I thought you'd be awesome at Jeopardy. Well, the name is well, I, my name is in in the mix. I'll, I'll, I'll put it that way. Oh my gosh! If you get to host my favorite show, you would. I mean, that would just be incredible. But now I got to work on this late night thing. <laughs> so listen, I don't want to keep you anymore. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for hanging out with us. I'm trying to keep all of the followers that I have occupied and smiling and happy and let them see what I get to see on the road when I get to meet such incredible people like yourself. And I'm really, I, I'm just so thankful that I have you and I just wish you luck with everything. I know we're all going to be watching and I know our paths are going to cross and we're going to get you that late night show. I have a feeling. <laughs> Thank you, Joey. Enjoy to talk. You're to the you. greatest. Be safe. And I'll talk to you soon. It's what we'll see. Well, bye. And everybody, thank you so much for hanging out with us. He's awesome. Have a great night. We'll see you soon. Bye.